Good afternoon, bookworms and flyleafs. Welcome to this week's episode of Author Reads here on Fay Productions. I am your host, Fairy Princess Lolly, and today I am here with author Chris Farnell. Hope I'm saying all of that right. Seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> uh, I, I am saying that correct, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, today, before we get into all of the things, please first like, subscribe, and stun the share button. Yes. I mean, you can also hit the bell if you want, but uh, share, 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 because that makes everything more fun when we're all here together. And then, of course, a shout out to today's sponsor, which is Heart Song Arts Pottery. You guys are all familiar with Heart Song Arts Pottery. They are your favorite site for earth-themed natural stained and glazed pottery of all sorts and varieties. They have mugs and planters and little fairy houses. You will find everything to tempt you. There is a garden's worth of pleasure with um, all kinds of totems and statues as well. So you can bring the fae to life in your everyday crockery. They have free delivery on all orders that are $35 or more. And uh, I suggest you go take a look at their stuff. They've got a lot of product and inventory that they've built up as we're coming into our, the Hala Thanks Moss um, season. So uh, please check them out, give them the likes and everything. All, all of the information is of course in the ticker, but also in the low bar as well. And then uh, with that said, then welcome to today's show, Chris. Hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> how, how are you doing today? Oh, very well, yes. <clears throat> so we, we get to have we get to have a reading from you today, uh, which is going to uh, to every American out there, of course, sound <laughs> extremely dignified because of your accent it's automatically, which is that fabulous. Covers for a lot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's late over there too, where you are. So you were saying past ten o'clock, so yeah, so you're up late, yeah. you're up late for this one, but that's okay because you're going to be taking us into space today. So dark is good. Dark is kind of on par with space. Uh, tell us a little bit, if you will, about who you are and where you're from and what you write. Uh, right. Well, um, I'm Chris. Uh, yeah, I'm based in the UK in Norwich, and um, yeah, I'm here today reading from Fermi's Progress, which is basically came from this place of missing sort of old-fashioned kind of planet of the week style sci-fi where your spaceship would come along land on a planet have an adventure there leave and then you would never hear about the planet again <laughs> and so the way that i do that is by having the spaceship have a malfunction that means it just blows up the planet when it leaves. So every week it's kind of like, uh, not you killed Kenny, but you killed the planet? Exactly, just the entire planet. Just we go to the planet, we have an adventure there, we explore, it's all cool, and then when you're done, you just vaporize it. <laughs> and it saves a lot of continuity, a lot of backstory worries. You know, it, it just really keeps things nice and simple. I, 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 almost feel like it's, I almost feel like it's like a little bit of Douglas Adams, right? Like, sorry, your planet is scheduled <laughs> to be exploded today. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would be lying if I said I hadn't read any Douglas Adams at uh, a formative age. So. <laughs> so what got you into writing this uh, particular particular series that you're doing? Um, Why is it? I uh, mainly, I think, just I uh, I think it's that I wanted to just write something that would really allow me to just play with as many ideas as possible. Just really get everything out of the toy box and mess about with it. And if I wanted to write a story that you know, it was a zombie story, I could do that. If I wanted to do a great big space opera thing, I could do that. And so just the, you know, planet destroying spaceship thing was just a nice device that just let me tell lots of very small self-contained stories. 
which has ended up being the longest and most epic thing I've ever written. But yeah, it's just it's a nice engine for letting you use up ideas. So with that said, how serious do you get with the with the technical sci-fi aspects of it? Because if we're if you have this sort of contained continuity, do you still develop the particulars of how spacecraft and all of that works since that part, the spacecraft itself is the consistent part through all of the little segments that you have? Well, I think it's it's basically con artistry. You're you're trying to be convincing, and right. I think I'd be lying if I said I didn't care about whether it was scientifically accurate. I have spreadsheets about how fast the ring on the spaceship spins around to keep gravity, how fast things are moving, things like that. But at the same time, you have to keep in mind that it is all a con. And the moment science gets in the way of the cool thing you want to do for the story, the cool thing you want to do for the story is going to win. And you're right. just going to have to have a scientist say, well, this is completely impossible, but it's happening. So it must be believable. And that, you know, tends to do your work for you. So tell me a little bit then about okay. So we're we're on the we're on the you like to try to give it the realism, but realism cannot be like story can't be sacrificed to that, right? Yeah, and I think it it is always a con, no matter how hard the sci-fi tries to appear, it's always going to eventually bend to the story when it comes to it. It's just a question of haggling, I think. Now, how many of these have you written in total? Oh, well, today is actually the day that I'm bringing out the fourth part of the cycle. And this is really the final part of this story in particular. There's four novellas, and together I feel like they all form one full book. Right. And then so, the full book would be called Fermi's Progress. That's right. And what is Fermi? Uh, Fermi is the name of the spaceship and also references the Fermi's paradox, the question, why haven't aliens gotten in touch? Which I think, you know, sort of has an implied answer with the premise of the story. Um, um, with, the, oh, with the premise of the story. I was like, yeah. I was just <laughs> waiting for you. <laughs> I was waiting for you to go on yeah. and tell me why it is that you do think aliens haven't got... Maybe they have. Maybe they're already here amongst us. Or maybe they just all explode. <laughs> there's, a, there's a ship going along that's just murdering them off. Yeah. Just a planet at a time. I mean, throughout the story, there's a few places where it sort of... You know, it plays about with the... Fermi's paradox question in places among the things that it talks about. So it is our is our ship here. Um, is it manned with humans or manned with other kinds of creatures or both? Uh, the Fermi is it's manned by humans and it was basically the product of this mad post-war scientist who has mixed together a bunch of experimental and obsolete Cold War technology. And it's got the the sort of core bit is the Buran Space Shuttle, which was the abandoned Russian space shuttle program, which, you know, there's just, sadly, I think the best example has been destroyed when the warehouse it was in collapsed. But there's various Buran Space Shuttles scattered around parts of Russia and the former Soviet Union. Then the back no, end no of it... No small territory. <laughs> no. And then, and then the back end is based on something called the Orion Propulsion Project, which was this idea that the US had where you had a ship that would just lob nuclear bombs out of the back of the ship and they would explode and the force of the nuclear explosion... Like, it would lift off this way. They, they had done all the maths on this. This wasn't 
pie in the sky. And nuclear explosions would just propel the ship along. And that got a really long way until I think it was J.F. Kennedy eventually thought it was all getting a bit militarised. But that wasn't a, you know, there were prototypes built, there were, the maths had been done, people were going to do this. So I see out there in our audience, Newton is out there, and I'm wondering if he knows anything about this particular Orion project that you're talking about, because he oftentimes has a unique uh, human science insight to give to us. So I'm kind of like, well, he says it would work, though it's not very safe from lifting off the earth, he says. No, uh, that was one of the reasons why they didn't take it much further than it got. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, very humble of you, Newt, very humble, yes. <laughs> uh, so, oh man, this this led me to a question that I was going to ask, and then I just like started laughing over Newton's comment, and now I've derailed my own brain. So how... It sounds like you've done a lot of research on all of this, uh, like spacecraft and whatnot. Are you, do you have some other connection to the industry or is it just pure fascination? Um, no, pure fascination. And like I said, it's con artistry. The more real stuff you can pack in there, the easier it is to slip past the completely made up stuff. But also, it, it's weird how often we arrive at this idea of spaceships being just this completely destructive thing. And the, the core, the thing that is supposed to be the main engine of the Fermi is the Alcubia drive, which is warp drive, basically. Okay. It's this idea that you have an engine that will compact the space in front of the ship whilst expanding the space behind it and this means you can move faster than light without breaking relativity is this like folding time in dune um a little bit but it's more it's closer to the sort of traditional star trek warp drive i so... i confess that i while i'm familiar with watching it i am not familiar with like the very back end geeky technical uh, explanations for how and why the warp drive works. If there was anything that I would want to know, how does it work? It would be the replicator or the holodeck. So that, <laughs> those would be the two things that I want. <laughs> well, I, the short version is nothing can move faster than light, but that we if, know of. No, nothing can move faster than light. Einstein says that's impossible, but if you squash the space up in front and stretch the space out in behind it, you can make it cover the distance faster than light could without the object actually moving faster than light. That, but that, that makes sense. A physicist called Geraint Lewis did the maths on this and predicted that if we actually built something like that, it would pick up so many particles along the way that it would just be a massive particle cannon and would just obliterate the planet when it got there. So uh, <laughs> Fermi is actually, you know, it wouldn't be much of a story if you blew up the planet before you arrived. So that's where the fudging comes in. Fair enough, fair enough. And you, you mentioned that the ship itself has the cylindrical... The, the Babylon 5 is how I imagine that. Yeah. Okay, so of all spaceships, be they sci-fi spaceships, this is kind of related slash not related, but of all of them, even including the way that you we sometimes see spaceships depicted uh, for aliens, mm. what do you think is the most likely to be a successful spaceship out there like, you know, they just is flying through space. I mean, the the boring answer is 
that the most expensive, most fallible, most breakable bit of any spaceship is the astronaut. So the boring answer is you get rid of that and just have robots. And just have robots. So, yeah. so a robot spaceship you think is the most... Uh, it's what we've done plausible. so far. Well, I guess that's technically true because basically we haven't put humans on Mars yet, but we've definitely put robotic rovers. So that's a thing more yeah. than once now. So uh, you could you could be right about that. We need to develop mm, much, much more high tech AI, I think, before we put robot people out there. And I think Raised by Wolves, the um, Ridley Scott series did a version of it. They executed the idea mm, with flaws, but the premise is solid, which is have an AI that is, you know, a proper supercomputer, have a probe, have some embryos in the probe, and then just grow and raise your humans when you get there rather than trying oh. to have to carry them the whole way. That's not a bad idea. Wow. But you've got that's to really weird. trust that computer. That's so, that's such a weird idea, though, from the perspective that if you went ahead and did something like that, the, the humans that would be growing up would basically be uh, planetary terrestrials from there. They would have no concept yeah. of what our society is they would have no concept of of what it what the people that sent them there to the, the they, kind of terraform but with humans are even like like who knows what they would even be you know without the context of our whole world and everything that's crazy they that's, would know what we programmed the computers to teach them right but that that doesn't that cannot possibly account for what it means to to say live in a city or a community no. right and so it would be very strange to see what a terrible of me to say what i'm about to say but <laughs> what an interesting experiment that would be yeah. <laughs> probably say, suggesting that humans be used in experiments though is probably not <laughs> not really high on the ethics list <laughs> so so tell me a little bit then specifically about what you're going to read to us from today well um i thought since we're you know we've got a very an audience who probably hasn't heard of fermi's progress before um i was going to start at the beginning which um doesn't work out well for you the listeners and readers at home it, it goes quite poorly for well everybody well we are in october and it is kind of a horror <laughs> horror month so <laughs> i guess if there's a time for things to go horribly <laughs> bad for people this is it so i am going to for i'm going to give you the screen here so that you can start your reading and for everybody watching at home, here's how this works. I'm just going to turn the whole screen over to Chris. And while Chris is reading, I will be in the comment section with you guys taking questions and other such things to ask after he's done reading. And then at the very end of the show, we will, of course, do our drawing for the free book giveaway. And I do understand that there will be some Patreon bonuses as well, Chris. Is that correct? Um, yeah. A deleted scene is... Uh... I... Yeah, I'll... We will yeah, sort after the show, afterwards. Yes. Uh, after, the, after the show, as always, when we publish yeah. those. So, um, if, and uh, with all of that said, then, you guys, I will give you the screen and put myself on mute. Okay. Uh, so this is the opening of Fermi's Progress, Dyson's Sphere. This is how you died. You were worrying about something, something that you probably thought was important. 
more important than the sky over your head and the strange things happening there. More important than the odd and scientifically implausible shapes the clouds were making. But that was the only warning you would get before the ground cracked and the horizon stretched like chewing gum torn between the pavement and a shoe. By then, self-interested creature that you are, you were already more worried about the ways your own body was betraying you. It too was distorting and spreading away, turning you into your own funhouse mirror reflection. You felt all of it, every nerve being dragged away from every other throughout your body all at once. It was the most complete pain. You never saw it coming. You would never know why it happened. And after a couple of seconds, it was over forever. At least it was quick. And so the first leg of the journey began. It ended at a door. The door was set into the base of an impossibly tall tower the shape of a sword blade and made out of a material that looks like porcelain. The door itself was only visible as a circular pattern carved into the otherwise impermeable wall of the tower. It had been closed a long time. In the length of time it took slime to become slime that could swim, slime that could crawl across the land and stand up and learn how to use tools and write stories and eat up their world and sit, staring into the unknowable sky as the last few elderly slime descendants died away and for everything they built to be eroded into dust while new slime took their place. The door stayed shut. And then, 31 days after you died, it opened. Pieces of the porcelain wall slid back and away. Blue light spilt out of the door and onto the ground around the tower, where it was broken by three shadows emerging into the world. A local would have seen three bipedal figures with grey and black skin, lit in places by the occasional bar of coloured electrical light. They each had two manipulating limbs and a shape like a stone tablet fastened to their backs. Where most creatures in this world kept a, cluster, kept a cluster of sensory organs on top and to the front, these things had a single golden orb. The foremost creature reached up a limb and slid back its gilded dome, revealing a glass bowl that contained a far, that contained a far smaller, meteor-looking head. Its face was mostly a pair of imposing cheekbones held together by an equally threatening chin. Placing a hand on each hip, he looked into the distance and intoned, We began as wanderers, and we are wanderers still. We have lingered long enough on the shores of the cosmic ocean. We are ready at last to set stay, sail for the stars. Despite the gravitas of his words, his voice had the cheery confidence of someone explaining the rules of sports. They only play in the expensive schools. The figure to his right lifted her own visor, revealing a face just lined enough to look distinguished. It had graced the cover of a thousand industry publications back home. Samson, did you spend the entire flight over here choosing that quote? She asked. Samson faced away from her as if inspecting some far horizon as he said, I may have picked it out before we left. Except, of course, there was no horizon. The ground and the sky simply faded into the distance, leaving a white blur to separate the two. Directly in front of the astronauts was a grassy incline, coasting downwards onto flat green terrain that rolled out to the absent horizon, broken only by a single straight blue river bisecting the landscape. 
The third astronaut opened his visor, revealing a face that looked oddly like Samson's. Except this face had jowls instead of cheekbones, and softer, more numerous chins. It's a bit disappointing, isn't it? He said. Samson looked aghast. Disappointing? How? Well, isn't this supposed to be the inside of a sphere? Shouldn't the horizon be all curving up and into the distance, while massive alien continents hang in the sky above us? I was expecting some serious majesty. This looks like the Norfolk Broads? Light gets dissipated through the atmosphere, the woman said. If the atmosphere is anything like Earth's, we should be able to see a good 20 kilometres away. On Earth, the horizon is... was. Barely a quarter of that distance. Here, if Vegeta's sums are right, the horizon would be roughly 150 times further away. Speaking of atmosphere, Samson said, referring to the smartphone mounted on the wrist of his suit. He frowned. Hmm. The memory on here is very low. What are these large media files? Regita loaded the Star Wars trilogy onto our phones, said the other man. It's the cinematic cuts. She said if the ship was destroyed, she wanted them to live on. Samson pulled a face to indicate he sympathised, if not entirely understood, then brought up a new app. I'm detecting a lot of nitrogen, a hefty chunk of oxygen, and a few tra traces of argon and carbon dioxide, he read. He looked up at the others, smiling as if he had just got a question right in a pub quiz. I think we could breathe this. Assuming it's not teeming with flesh-eating bacteria, the other man said. Oh, Connor, you worry too much, Samson said cheerily. The chances are that any airborne bacteria on this planet would find your flesh quite unappetising. And what are the chances of firing ourselves into space, at random, only to arrive at a giant artificial sphere with a breathable atmosphere? Connor asked. I hate to say it, but Connor's right, the woman agreed. We're not jumping to any conclusions. Well, of course not, Samson said, sounding only a little put out. But one shouldn't underestimate the value of a hopeful outlook, especially in desperate times such as these. We could be looking at the new cradle of humanity. Well, we'd better be, Gordon said, taking a few steps out onto the alien meadow. For their sake. What do you mean, for their sake? Connor asked. Gordon rolled her eyes. Don't be obtuse. I mean that if we can't build some kind of survivable home on this world, we'll have to look elsewhere. Yeah, but that's not actually on the table, is it? Connor said. Samson, tell Gordon that's not on the table. It's not, said Samson firmly, his face taking on a sterner expression. Oh, relax, the pair of you, Gordon said. We still don't know there's anything actually alive here. And if there is, we don't know that it'll be sentient. So you think this is one of those naturally occurring Dyson spheres? Connor asked. They didn't respond to our signals. The docking mechanism was automated. The whole thing could be abandoned. There's this grass, Samson said, crouching down and brushing a hand along the floor. The first non-terrestrial organism encountered by humankind. I'd say that's pretty momentous. The blades of grass were more like four-leaf clovers, but with five leaves, each perfectly hexagonal. Well, while you open diplomatic channels, I'll get on with the actual work, Gordon said, 
turning her attention to her own phone and tapping a couple of icons. There was a ringing inside her helmet, and then an agitated voice said, Yes? Regita, get the hab inflatable ready, along with all the relevant instruments. We're coming back, and then we're going to set up a base camp. Really? Regita gasped. So not only do I miss out on the real live Dyson sphere, but I have to pack your camping stuff as well. Is that a problem? Gordon asked. No, not at all. I'll just stop trying to understand the unfathomable workings of the prototype FDL engine and find you some tent pegs and a thermos. Hey, Connor said. Can anyone see those boats? Gordon swiped Regita's call off her phone, selected the long-distance lens and removed it from her wrist mount to look into the distance. Where? Connor pointed, and Samson lifted a hand over his eyes and followed the finger. Far along the river, just before it faded to white, they could make out masts. We should go and meet them, Samson said. You're joking, Connor said, as Samson began walking in the direction of the boats. This is an alien world. We don't know whether they're killer robots, or acid-blooded dick monsters, or fucking smurfs. We can't just waltz up and say hi. Your before Weight Watchers photo is right, Gordon said. We should study them at a distance, figure out who we're dealing with before we go over and ask if they're on Facebook. They're travelling at a brisk walking pace, Samson said. A brisk walking pace is the very fastest we can move up here. By the time we report back to the ship and come back and come out again, they'll be beyond, well, not the horizon, but they'll be gone. And we've no way of knowing if this is a regular thoroughfare or an isolated back road. They might be the last people we ever see. You're being melodramatic, Gordon said. The interior surface of this sphere is 550 million times that of Earth, Samson minded her. A trillion people could live here and each have an area the size of Kazakhstan to themselves. He saw the way Gordon was looking at him. Is something wrong? Did you just work that out off the top of your head? She asked. He did, Connor said. That Kazakhstan thing's probably right too. He used to memorise the atlas. Well, I was doing some severe rounding. Kazakhstan is actually a little conservative. But then again, that assumes a totally habitable interior surface, Samson began. All right, Gordon gasped. She tapped her phone screen again. Regita, put that packing on hold. We're going to meet the neighbours. And that is the first chapter. It is 2.40. Do you want to give us one more chapter? Uh, yeah, okay. Let's go into the next part. It's off to takes... a good start, for sure. So... Well, the next part takes place seven days before you die. Humans had waited a long time to meet the neighbours. Despite years of searching, they'd found no radio signals, no television broadcasts. There were no invading alien fleets, even though it would take only a few million years to cross the galaxy with even the most mundane forms of propulsion. So the question remained, why didn't anyone get in touch? A possible solution is that the question shouldn't have been, why hasn't, got anyone, why hasn't anyone got in touch, but why would they? Maybe the Earth was unremarkable and the human race was a typically shaped sausage to come out of evolution's meat grinder. Until Earth became an active nuisance to its neighbours, it was likely to be left alone. Even then, 
the first alien message was less likely to be, take me to your leader, than can I speak to your manager? Yes, of course, sir. I'll put you through now, Connor said into his headset. He pressed the hold button, put in the manager's extension and explained, Yes, I know it's a pain. Sorry, Greg, they weren't having any of it. Yes. Anyway, transferring now. Thanks. Bye. He pressed transfer and slumped face first into his keyboard, blindly reaching for a cup of tea he suspected was already cold. Christ, Connor, you look like Frankenstein's monster. Connor looked up blearily to see Cheryl from sales watching him. Frankenstein, he said, taking a sip of tea that turned out to still have a little residual warmth. Sorry, Cheryl asked. The monster's name was Frankenstein, he said. Don't worry, it's a common misconception. No, no, you've got it the other way round, Cheryl said. It's definitely Frankenstein's monster. I studied it for my degree. Never mind, Connor said, as his phone began to ring again. He tapped answer and recited, Dynamo Windows, you can see right through us. How can I help this morning? Hello, boomed an all too familiar voice into his headset. It sounded just a little like Connor's own. I told you, Sam, you're not supposed to call me at work, Connor said ducking behind his cubicle partition and talking in a whisper. Are you hungover? Connor stifled a groan. Why are you hungover on a weekday morning? Samson asked. Well, I don't want to be hungover at the weekend, do I? Connor said. I've got stuff to do. I don't know why you're still working that dead-end job, Samson said. You could do so much better. I've got an office job, and it pays 8 50 an hour. That's doing well in millennial terms, Connor said. You're 34, and you're a temp, Samson said. Everyone's a temp, Connor answered. It's the beauty of the gig economy. Can I hang up yet? I need you, Samson said. I'm on my way to pick you up. You can't come to get me, I'm at work. Connor said steadily, and can I hear helicopter blades? I found it, Samson said. I found the final piece of our father's legacy. Congratulations. Is it a bomb? A really big bomb? No, wait. A really big bomb filled with spiders. Would love to chat, Samson said. But I'm afraid I'm working to a bit of a deadline. Meet me on the roof in 10 minutes. Can you remember the email I sent you when you asked about Christmas dinner? Connor asked. Let me check. Uh, yes, here it is. What does it say? Connor asked. Samson clicked on the email and read out. Go away, you coiffed git. Why coiffed? That seems like an oddly specific insult. Is coiffed hair a bad thing? Bye, Samson, Connor said, reaching for the Terminate button. Wait, Samson said. Whatever else you do, remember this. If you're asked to go into the manager's office, don't go. Trust me, it's important. Connor opened his mouth to respond. Then, instead clicked the terminate button on his computer. The phone immediately began to ring. Somebody, somewhere, wasn't happy with their double glazing. Connor looked at the blinking red icon on his monitor for a few seconds. At that moment, Greg passed by Connor's desk. This was the hazard of having the aisle desk, a lot of through traffic. Stuart at the window seat at the other end of the aisle was only a week of the end of his contract. As soon as he was gone, Connor was having that desk. Greg made to lean against the partition, even though the slightest weight would have brought the whole thing crashing down. 
he was a short, awkwardly puffed up man, like someone had replaced a pigeon's head with that of a Kendall and put it in a suit. Hey, Connor, could you step into my office for a second? When you're free, obviously. Sure thing, Connor said, moving to get up. Greg looked disapprovingly at the ringing phone. As soon as I've taken this call, Connor added. Five minutes later, Connor had talked yet another valued customer through the Dynamo Windows state-of-the-art customer feedback form, hung up, and clicked the picture of the tiny cartoon toilet. He stood up, letting his office chair roll away behind him, picked up his cold cup of tea, and walked down the aisle of cubicles towards the glass-walled manager's office. It oversaw the call desks like the drummer at the aft of a Roman galley. He felt his feet drag as he was walking. It's not that Connor paid much attention to his brother. Samson's quests, projects and adventures were things that Connor was happy to hear about third hand whenever there was an unexplained explosion on the news. The office of Dynamo Windows was deliberately as far away from that world as Connor could get, and he didn't care that it was living down to expectations. The only dangers that lurked inside that office beneath the Path to Success poster and the cover of Glass and Glazing Products magazine Greg had once appeared on, were the long overdue termination of Connor's temp contract, or the possibility they might move him into sales. He was safe here. Without breaking stride, Connor turned and began walking towards the exit. It was a little ritual of his to bunk off shortly before the lunch on the last day of any temp job. He had never been stopped or even seen the hours docked from his paycheck. He knew how to walk out of an office as if, it, as if he was supposed to. He wasn't feeling great anyway, and a day off would probably do him good. He walked at an ordinary pace, like he was taking a toilet break or going to sort a printer jam. He had never sorted a printer jam. Someone emerged from the kitchenette. Cheryl from sales was coming towards him. She was eight steps away by the time he reached the door and was reaching into her handbag. Why did she have her handbag? Connor swiped his lanyard and with a beep the door unlocked. As he was pushed, as he pushed against it, he glanced back to see Cheryl was holding a gun. He threw cold tea into her eyes and began to run. Are we done? Uh, I think that's, yeah, I think that's a good stopping point. All right. So, very good then, very good. It's question the time. Uh, so, give me just a second here to kind of scroll back through our comments and find our questions for today. Let's see. You use many interesting turns of phrase. Do they come? Uh, do they come to you straight away, or do you try out many until you narrow into one? And I have to say, this is totally true too. I was just listening to some of these, and I'm like, these are crazy metaphors. I love them. They're so good. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, there's. I tend to just try and write in stream of consciousness and just try and get the story down as quickly as possible and then edit afterwards and a lot of that is deleting stuff that sounded clever in your head at the time but then you read it back and not so much <laughs> and some of it survives <laughs> is basically uh, how it works uh, uh, unlike a planet something survives as opposed to just everything being annihilated exactly so, i'm curious though like how I feel like metaphors are a unique talent in the in the realm of writing. And some people it just comes very easily. Like the first the first one that struck me was back in the first chapter that you read immediately, like the first two sentences, few few sentences, maybe paragraphs, whatever. Um, you talked about space stretching the way bubble gum stretches between your shoe and your pave, you know, the pavement and your shoe like on a hot day and it 
I was like, oh, that's such a good description. And I feel like that that is a very unique talent that has to be developed with most writers. You know, it doesn't mm. come easily, I don't think, to most people. Do you have techniques that you use for coming up with those kinds of, you know, th those kinds of visual comparisons like that? I mean, it, it's basically playing Snap, isn't it? It's you... What's playing Snap? Um, do you, do you know the, the card game Snap? You put down... You have a deck of cards, you put down cards, and if someone puts down a card, then you put down a card and it's the same card, you shout snap, and... I probably should know of it because it sounds very familiar, but it also sounds like something I haven't probably played in ages and ages, so... Uh, but yes, so, like but, playing snap. Yeah. It's basically just, you picture this thing, and then you just run through things that... Until something... It looks a bit like until you find something that is pithy enough and short enough that you can try and slot it in without anyone really registering you trying to be clever. <laughs> well, I mean, it, I think though that you're only trying to be clever if you haven't succeeded. Because if you've succeeded, then you just simply are clever, right? Like, there's no try. Well, I think the, the goal is to make a picture in the reader's head rather than trying to, you know, show off. Right, that's fair. How, that's fair. Rather than Clever having the language be. get in the way. You want them to be in the story rather than, you know, thinking about what words you're using. Right, that, ma that makes sense. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, actually. There, let's see, there was a... I'm sorry. I, I thought I had seen something back there. We, uh, I was talking with some people in the chat a little bit as you were reading. And it, so Katie said this. Noticed in the last chapter, there was a character named Vegeta. Did I say that right? Uh, oh, Vegeta, I think Vegeta. is probably Vegeta. the name they picked up on. Uh I don't know why Katie put this in the comments, but that made me wonder if there was some kind of significance to that name. Um, uh, um, Brigitte, she's um, of Asian heritage. Uh, it's a you know, fairly common Indian name. Uh, yeah, so, she's the sort of physicist slash mechanic aboard the ship. Who, oh, here. She says... If you happen to be an anime fan and aware of Dragon Ball Z, um, but I—I I mean, I'm only mm. kind of aware of its existence. I uh, yeah. Um, uh, sorry, this sounds terrible, but uh, my my son is very into Dragon Ball Z, but uh, it's something that's passed me by. Anime is one of those things I keep meaning to get a grounding in, but I've apart from almost finishing Cowboy Bebop. I um, don't really know much anime. <laughs> I have not seen Cowboy Bebop either. It is good. <laughs> so... It's basically where Firefly stole all its ideas from. Oh, it came out before then. Yeah, it, I think it, there's like a difference Josh of about Raven a year, a but uh, yeah, I mean, theft is a, you know, long and honourable history in writings. But yeah, definitely. I'm very sorry. I got booted from my studio just there. <laughs> like it just booted me out. Welcome like, back. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Welcome back to my own show. That's that's fabulous. Uh, let's see here. A Fermi is a series of logical steps. Of whom or what is Dyson fearful? I wonder. Uh, I, I, I'd love to be mysterious about it, but basically, I am a sucker for a pun. It's for set a pun. in a Dyson Sphere. There's Dyson sphere. things happening. Dyson Sphere. It, it, <laughs> I just, I like puns. If I can get a pun into a title, there is going to be a pun in that title. <laughs> Dyson Sphere. Daycarmageddon is the next one. It's followed by Planet of the Apiaries. 
giant bees. And <laughs> the last one is the phone job, which doesn't seem like a pun until you've actually read it. But yes, uh, I'm going to put a pun in the title and nobody can stop me. <laughs> no, we are we are all punsters here, though. So you're in good company, at least at least around here. And uh, I think that the Dyson Sphere is a great pun. So does Newt, actually. Like that pun is hilarious. And it is. <laughs> I, even I knew what a Dyson Sphere was. Okay. I'm very proud of myself on that one. So let's see here. Um, do you ever reverse the adventure and tell it from the inhabitants point? Um, the inhabitants of the world being explored, that POV. I, yeah, actually, um, within most of the stories, there's usually at least a few parts. To varying degrees, there's usually at least a chunk of the story that's told from the perspective of the aliens who are you know, being visited by the spaceship. And, yeah, because I think that that's part of the fun of writing alien planets. It's not just go down and see all through human eyes it's wondering what things look like to the aliens and how aliens think as well what do things look like when you take away human assumptions so when you uh, this isn't a question from the audience but when you're writing about these planets and the places that the humans go how into the world building of the alien worlds do you get do you like to do you know the the flora and fauna and or is it just sort of, you know, whatever comes to mind and that's what we go with and don't on to the next world? Um, I would like to have a solid worldview for the aliens. I like to know how the people on the planet see the world and how they're different from us. And I like to, I want to try and give the impression that there is more going on than you see. Right. I don't really like the sort of, in like old Star Trek The Next Generation episodes, you visit a planet, there will be one city on the planet. Everyone is concerned with this one social issue that the, that week is a metaphor for, and then you move on. I want to try and give the impression, just through like little snippets of stuff that never really get filled in, but I want to give the impression that there is a whole much more deeper and complex world here that you could learn about if I didn't kill everyone. <laughs> but someday you'll have to do like extended universe, you know, little little one offs, right? I would love to, but they're probably dead. Well, I mean, like before, <laughs> before the you could you could really <laughs> torture your readers by writing the stories and then just have like. The story of somebody on the planet that has no interaction at all with what's going on, and then just their world ending, and the story yeah. doesn't get finished, and it's just like that joke in the Breakfast Club where he's going along and telling the joke, and you never hear the punchline because he falls through the ceiling. Just nobody ever gets to know the end of the story. <laughs> there, is cool there are moments that touch on that kind of feeling throughout the <laughs> four novellas. <laughs> Uh, in um, in Plans of the Apiaries, it's a sort of gas giant type planet with moons around it. And there's mention of Archipelago, which is a moon that has been like shattered. And each fragment of the moon has developed its own deep and fascinating ecosystem. And it's a oh. wonderful place for exploring and adventuring. You never see it. It's just mentioned in passing. Just... And then it's vaporized by the end of the story. It's just, you know, something that's there. Would be cool to visit, but. But no. Well, so with that said, you guys, names in the comment. Now is the time. Put your names in and we will get you on to the Wheel of Win. We have one last question here. I'll take it from Newt. What uh, What are some of your favorite sci-fi stories and creators? Oh, it's always a tough one. I think... I think Stanislaw Lem is one that I think should be getting more love these days. He, particularly the Star Diaries, which are a collection of short stories about this one astronaut. And it is basically Douglas Adams before there was Douglas Adams. 
it is just ridiculous satirical one-off adventures about planets where everyone is a robot that hates humans but it turns out that all the robots are actually humans in disguise and don't want anyone else to find out or a planet Mr. Robot. sentient furniture or just really this the sort of thing i was aiming for with furby which is just throwing ideas out there using them and disposing them and then just throwing out another one uh, Stanis Lem is really good at that. He gets remembered a lot more for his more serious stuff like Solaris and The Invincible. But when he does comedy, he is really cutting and brilliant and hilarious. I always feel like comedy would be a difficult thing to write. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I guess I... It, it seems like coming up with comedy and having it seem natural seems like a different like a very hard thing to do so it's a strange thing because it is honestly it's like the baseline for how i communicate i think i would struggle to write stuff without comedy in it just because a lot of the time it feels like the most efficient way to communicate a given idea fair enough I think I mean, a lot of the time jokes are just information compression. That is an interesting concept. I certainly know that if you have people laughing, you probably have them listening. So that is that is a truth. So here we go. It is, oh gosh, it's 3.04. I lost track of the time. Uh, we have the Wheel of Win here. I think I've got all of our names. So we'll put them on Yon Wheel. Head spin, and this is for our copy. It, it is of the Dyson Sphere, right? Yeah. Yes, and congratulations, you are the winner of today's. Yes, and I'm sure that he will love that. So, uh, I, I will, I'm excited to tell him, and I will, of course, get you his information after the show. Ah, uh, Melissa, I'm sorry, I already did the spinny spinny part. Um, all right, so with. That, with that said, and congratulations again to Joel, is there anything that you would like to say to us before we let you go this afternoon? Ah, thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And for everybody, of course, um, Chris's information and links so that you can buy Fermi's Progress are in the low bar wherever you're watching from. So please go check that out. You know, give the give the follows. Twitter, I think, is where you're probably most active. So yeah, it's the easiest so, place to find me. Yep. So go go give the uh, follows and whatnot on the Twitters and check it out. And if you do buy a book, please remember leave uh, leave a review because it really does help the indie authors a lot. And uh, with that said, thank you so much for being on the show. Happy Friday, and I hope you have a good weekend as well. Thank you. You too. Thanks. All, All right. right. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Hello, friends. This is Gone for Hammerhands. Thank you for checking out Fairy Princess Lolly's channel. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like and subscribe button. Use your troll hammer to ring that little bell icon to get notifications when she posts future videos. And if you'd like to support these magical creations, fly over to our Patreon and join the fairy family.